I would like to start my talk by way of showing you an image of Fresh Kills Park, which is located on the western edge of Staten Island, a borough of New York City. You can actually see the skyline of Manhattan in the hazy background. This park is the largest park in New York and is about to become a world-class park with miles of biking and running trails, serpentine water features, a wind farm, and many more extraordinary features, if we believe the official webpage of Staten Island. This park is of interest to me because it is built on top of 150 million tons of solid waste. And nothing reminds the visitor of the fact that he's actually walking over one of the world's biggest landfills that had served the great, greater New York community from 1948 to 2001. This landfill contains primarily municipal solid waste or household trash, ranging from packing material to sinks. The American flag gets an honorable mention. To put it differently, the dump consists of objects and substances that consumers, for whatever reason, disposed of because they regarded them as unusable, undesirable, or unwanted. It is important to note that this change in attitude towards objects and substances marks the very moment when they die and become obsolete. It is then that we would refer to them as waste, rubbish, garbage, or trash. We no longer appreciate and use them, but rather keep them in special places and receptacles, such as garbage bins, either inside the house or on our property, before garbage collectors take them away for good. For most Westerners, the disposal of rubbish is a gradual process of separation and disappearance. We feel uneasy when we are confronted with yesterday's rubbish. At times when garbage collectors go on strike and bring this continuous process of removal to a halt. We cannot appreciate the intricate interplay of the bright colors of the bagging material because the sense that we see matter out of place, that is to say, waste matter that is encroaching into our sphere of living instead of being taken away from us, is so overwhelming. It indicates the breakdown of order. Different societies, of course, have different waste management systems and a different tolerance of dirt. And this explains variation in the spatial distribution patterns of waste. In this village in Egypt, for instance, where most of the household rubbish is burned, it is acceptable to dispose of rubbish at the edge of the sediment and watch its steady accumulation and decay. I want to draw your attention to this little rubbish hill here um, because it is located close to um, the big rubbish dump here, but it is as close to the streets as any rubbish can get. Its location is very um, important and can be explained uh, in terms of its reuse value because it's dung that is collected there and will be brought to the fields eventually. In the remaining time, I will talk about the disposal of rubbish in ancient Greece. Let me add that when I use the term ancient Greece, I refer to old settlements that were, that were populated by Greek people around the Mediterranean Sea, including the Greek colonies in the West and the East. By focusing on the fascinating world of rubbish in ancient Greece, I choose to neglect the iconic temples like the Parthenon that majestically marks the skyline of modern Athens. But this approach gives me a chance to shed new light on a hitherto neglected aspect of ancient Greece the people that inhabited Greek cities and settlements, and the way they conceived of and treated the objects and substances that we would subsume under the term waste. Discussing disposal processes and practices of past societies is more difficult than analyzing those of present societies, as we cannot observe people and interview them. Archaeologists have to reconstruct the past on the sole basis of primary sources, and the literary and archaeological sources are fragmentary and rarely complement each other. While it is not possible to fully reconstruct any aspect of life for ancient Greek settlements at any given time, it is possible to study systematically spatial distribution patterns of waste across time and thus to reconstruct human behaviors and attitudes towards objects and substances at the end of the use life. My talk consists of two parts. I will first discuss the disposal of waste in Greek settlements and sanctuaries with a view to finding out how important it was for the ancient Greeks to separate themselves from their rubbish and whether different waste matters required different treatments. I will argue 
that ancient Greeks removed rubbish from the immediate living area, but that it was often still visible before it was removed to its final dumping place. As waste matter remained accessible, it was often reclaimed and recycled and reappeared in a different place or in a different shape. In the second part, I will briefly focus on waste matter that required special disposal practices. In accordance with my spatial approach, I will pay special attention to locations that are termed a place of no return or an away place in modern waste management. These terms refer to places where people throw things away permanently and expect never to deal with them again. Let me start with the first part, the disposal of rubbish as a daily practice, as a daily routine. Brick houses were rather small. They normally consisted of only a few rooms spread over two floors and a courtyard. The literary sources have no doubt that houses should be clean. The earliest evidence are the Homeric ethics and the poem by Simonides on woman, which is fragment, uh, West Fragment No. 7. These textual sources of the late 8th and the 7th century specify that a clean house should be free of cobwebs, dust and dirt. Regular cleaning routines were necessary to maintain a clean house, which were carried out by the landlady and or her servants, depending on the size and the wealth of the, of the household. But there are no references as to where the sweepings were to be dumped. Each house had a so-called andron, a man's room in which a symposium could be held. This drinking parties could be rather wild and messy, as you can see in the right image, Re requiring a thorough cleaning of the andron the next day. Some of the wealthy houses made cleaning easy by installing drains that would empty into the next room, as in this fourth century house in Eretria on UB at the Illustrates. At first glance, this mosaic of an unswept drawer seems to undermine my argument because it shows foot debris on the floor. This mosaic is part of a large mosaic that was unearthed in a Roman city, but it is believed that the original artist was Sozos, who worked in the Greek city of Pergamon in the Hellenistic period. <coughs> in this close-up, you see that this is not ordinary foot waste that you see on the floor of the dining room. It is expensive food. The whole point of this mosaic is not to show a dirty floor, but rather that people dining in this house are rich. It is not a depiction of rubbish, but of conspicuous consumption. A substance called copros is of great concern. Copros denotes all kinds of organic waste and could comprise of bodily waste. The most sophisticated copros collection facilities for human excrements have been found in the late classical settlement in Olympos in northern Greece. It is not a water closet, but an installation on top of cesspit, which had to be emptied out on a regular basis. Cesspits were quite common features of Greek houses, but not all houses had one. In Athens, for instance, people used portable urinal urinals and chamber pots. Here you see one for men and one for women and one that was the property of Nikos, it says Amis, ur um, urinal of Nikon, and it breaks off. And these urinals were emptied into the street and the allies. Alternatively, um, the Athenians um, relieved themselves in the street if we believe the classical comedian of Athens, Aristophanes. Only very few households in Athens had the privilege to be close enough to the great brain public draining system for storm and excess water that emptied into the Eridanos River so that they could connect their private drainage system at their own expense to that of the city of Athens. Households with animals or households in rural areas collected organic matter that could be used to manure fields on their property. The evidence that can be stated in support is Book 17-290 in, in the Odyssey. In this passage, Odysseus is returning to his home and his loyal dog Argos, lying on the dung heap in front of the house, recognizes him. Copronus, facilities for the collection of organic waste matters, were unearthed in courtyards of houses in Athens and Halliers. Here, I show you a house that was excavated in Halliers, which is located at the south tip of the Agai Peninsula. It is likely that the inhabitants of these houses also disposed of all the domestic and industrial waste here, including kitchen waste, table scrap, hot 
are broken pots, sweepings, and byproducts of the processing of oil of oil, which took place in the courtyard. This would at least explain why we find so many potsherds on fields that were in the nude in classical antiquity. In ancient Greece, vessels made of clay were for storage, cooking, uh, for storage, cooking, and dining. They broke easily, and only a small fraction of broken vases were repaired. Hence, it is fair to state that the waste stream generated by Greek households comprised mainly of potsherds. However, potsherds had a high reuse value and seemed to have been reclaimed to a high degree by various, for various purposes. Routine recycling processes of potsherds include the use as a kind of scrap paper. You see on the left a shopping list, you see a casual me uh, message on the top right, and it reads, put the saw under the threshold of the garden gate. And at the bottom right, you see an abortive abecedario. Citizens in Athens also use potsherds to stretch onto them the name of the politician that they wanted to see exiled. Sturdy amphora handles were ideal for recurring bumpy um, roads. Large body fragments, by contrast, were often used as containers, for instance, to bury children or as temporary flower pots. The early fourth century example that you see here on the left shows a participant in the festival of the Adonia climbing a ladder to put the flower pot on her roof garden. Recut and reworked pieces of pots served as game pieces and as toys. Let me also mention, um, again, this is a kind of honorary mention of uh, a very unusual way to, uh, unusual um, recycling practice of, uh, of a potsherd. And this is mentioned in a forensic speech. That is to say, someone uh, went to court um, because he accused someone else of attacking him with a potsherd. Um, interestingly, um, this was not considered something ridiculous, but something that was taken very seriously. I can't show you an image of a person attacking someone else with a portrait, but what I can show you, because it's um, quite frequently depicted in the world of images, are kentaurs, um, the wild beasts that are attacking the lapids, which you see here, that are using broken pots as impromptu weapons in order to attack the lapids um, that are very close to human beings and therefore use proper weapons. So far, we have established that household rubbish was collected in cesspits, collection facilities, in courtyards, and was littering the streets, which were regarded as public places. Individuals such as Aristophanes, who did not like dirty and smelly cities and preferred to live in the countryside, were in the minority, it seems, since only a few disposal regulations have survived for, survived for Greek settlements. The earliest one is mentioned by Aristotle in Ateneum Politia 51 2 and refers to cla classical Athens. In this passage, it is noted that city officials called Agoranomoi may rely on slaves to remove unclaimed corpses from the streets of Athens. It is also noted that the Koprologoi, private entrepreneurs operating in Athens who cleaned out cesspits, were obliged by law to deposit the contents outside of the Athenian city walls where the fields and gardens of the city were located. A legislative prohibition concerning the disposal of other waste matter was of no concern to the government of Athens and indeed any other Greek city at that time. This said, accumulating waste heaps in public places were removed whenever areas were being restructured and reorganized. They were used to level areas and to construct new streets, to channel small rivers, to fill cisterns and wells that had fallen out of use. At these occasions, waste was permanently removed from site and buried in the ground. City authorities seem to have played a more active role in the management of sanctuaries, like this one uh, you see here. This is the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Zeus in Olympia. They issued numerous legislative prohibitions that, re that regulated um, the disposal of waste. A waste matter that was seldom tolerated within centuries was coplos. The appropriate treatment of other waste matter, such as food debris from public feasting, broken pots, old and damaged votive offerings, was not regulated. But it was common practice to create rubbish sheets within centuries that would only disappear when wells had to be filled, areas to be 
um, prepared for new construction projects or when material was necessary for the construction of new structures. A quick look at the disposal practices in the Panhellenic sanctuary of Sus in Olympia may illustrate my point. So really, um, all the votive offerings that you see in the Museum of Olympia is coming from the area that is constructed by the Temple of Hera, the Temple of Sus, which was built much, much later, and the stadium. And the votives um, were found as rubbish, sacred rubbish, deposited in the wells, in the construction layers, and indeed in the earthwork um, for the stadium. I've been speaking ab in abstract terms about sacred rubbish, and I just want to show you a couple of examples from Olympia. So here you see a section, this is sand, this is an accumulation of sacred rubbish, and here you look on top of it and you might be able to make out um, small terracotta figurines. Some of them are complete, but most of them are actually broken. Olympia is famous for sacred rubbish that was made out of metal. Um, you don't find many complete vessels or complete objects. They were all broken down into small pieces and then um, being distributed all over the century. So you wouldn't find um, ritual depositions of these objects, but you see them being cut down and being um, dispersed wherever um, they could be um, put to the best use. So far, I've tackled regime disposal practices of waste. I would like to conclude the first part by looking at an extreme case of rubbish disposal as it allows me to illustrate that different cities adopted different approaches when it came to dealing with their waste. More specifically, I would like to briefly discuss the ways in which the inhabitants of the city of Athens and Miletus dealt with the fact that their city was laying waste by the Persian army in 480, 479 BC and 494 BC respectively. That is to say, Miletus was destroyed earlier than Athens. The Athenians were keen to restore normality in the lower city and dump the destruction debris in cisterns and wells. Their main sanctuary, the Acropolis of Athens, lay in ruins for a generation before, before it was rebuilt. But when the Athenians were ready to tackle this large-scale project, they treated the destruction debris as they would have treated any other waste matter. They used it to level the ground and to extend the platform for the Acropolis so that you could walk on it. So again, everything a cake that you find in the Acropolis Museum, like these three examples, they are coming from the fill. And before the large, large scale excavations in the early 19th century, visitors were actually walking on the sacred rubbish. Part of it is rock, as you can see here, but most of it was really fill. Just to give you a um, sense of the magnitude of this project, we're talking about 50,000 cubic meters of soil, architecture, and um, dedications that were broken that had to be moved. And I think you see very nicely um, with the humans as a kind of scale um, how big this project um, was. Here you see um, the removal and the searching for um, valuable um, objects. And here um, you see a couple of humans standing just in front of the foundation of the Parthenon. And you actually um, don't see any longer the sacred rubbish um, because it has already been put to um, a storage place. They only kept a few statues, the Athenians, like the statue of Athena made by the famous sculptor Endoios as a war memorial. The Milesians, by contrast, did not choose to bury their de destruction debris in underground structures such as cisterns, wells, pits, and cuttings. Instead, they decided to carry it up a nearby hill, the so-called Kalabakh Tepe, to create an impressive landmark that would remind them of the Persian destruction that set an end to the thriving metropolis. <coughs> Summing up, objects that had reached the end of their use life because they were broken or unwanted and substances that were undesirable, such as bodily waste, were collected in pits or dumped outside the house in the public realm. While this treatment suggests that ancient Greeks felt it necessary to separate themselves from rubbish by way of containment in receptacles or by way of removal from their property, it is also clear that it's present in public areas, such as streets, did not pose a major threat. In fact, dirty streets and rubbish heaps in urban and sacred landscapes were most likely the norm. 
accumulations of rubbish in public areas, including sanctuaries, were only diminished when individuals reclaimed waste matter and put it to a different purpose, and when city authorities decided to reconstruct and rebuild certain areas of the city. This leads to the second part um, of this paper, which relies heavily on textual sources. Here, I explore instances in which it was essential for the well-being of a community to get permanently rid of waste. It should be clear by now that the permanent disposal of dangerous waste was not a routine disposal practice. It was rather the exception. <coughs> waste matter that required immediate permanent disposal had one thing in common, if we trust the literary evidence, that is. It was associated with miasma, to use the ancient Greek term. Miasma can be translated as dirt and pollution. Perfect away places were places beyond the borders of a settlement. Ultimate places of no return were barren and remote landscapes, such as the mountains and deep and large watery bodies. According to the textual sources, the sea was the better choice because some would deal with the retrieval of children that were left to die on a mountainside and were found by a shepherd. The myth of Oedipus is perhaps the best example of such a myth. Stories about the sea, by contrast, portrayed as an ideal away place. One of the best known stories portraying the sea as a place of no return is that of Polycrates, which the Greek historian Herodotus narrates in some detail, that is in book 3, 40 to 43. The tyrant of Samos, Polycrates, tried to avoid the jealousy of the gods that might arise from his streak of constant good luck and the subsequent shameful deaths that he was sure to incur. As a result, Polycrates devised a clever plan that would instead bring him misfortune and true sadness. He threw into the sea the thing that was dearest to him, his ring. In Herodotus' version of the story, Polycrates' main motive for casting this precious ring into the sea was his desire to be permanently rid of it. Polycrates' plot was not successful because he forgot that he was no ordinary man, but a person who was always lucky and would even get his own things back from the sea. He understood immediately that the retrieval of his ring was no cause for joy. This unlikely event was a bad omen and foreshadowed his coming doom. Vast and deep waterscapes and valid and wild landscapes may have been ideal dumping places for items and substances that had to be disposed of irretrievably. But the deposit of 191 ostraka voting tokens, that is, at the bottom of a deep well at the north slope of the Acropolis of Athens, suggests that not all Greeks followed the rules outlined in the textual sources. This group of voting tokens is unusual in many respects. For once, ostraka of a single ostracism are rarely found together in a well. In addition, 190 ostraka, mostly the round feet of drinking cups, were all inscribed with the name of Themistocles, son of Neocles of the Dimi Freagios. Furthermore, a careful analysis of the handwriting reveals that these 190 ostraka were written by only 14 people. The most convincing explanation to date interprets these ostraka as an attempt of the enemies of Themistocles to influence the outcome of the ostracism by making available ready-made ostraka for distribution to illiterate or undecided voters. If correct, the fact that the voting tokens were thrown deep down into a well and covered by a lot of waste could be explained in terms of a public statement, presumably made by the Athenian government, that foul play is not acceptable in a democratic society. To conclude, in ancient Greece, waste was not a homogenous mass of discarded or unwanted items and substances, as, is, as it is in modern Western European countries. And I hope to have demonstrated today that there were many ways to dispose of rubbish. It is perhaps not surprising that the ancient Greeks didn't have a collective term comparable to the English term waste. The existence of the abstract concept of miasma for everything dirty and polluted suggests that the lack of a comparable concept of waste cannot be explained by lack of abstract thinking, but rather in terms of social irrelevance. 
Greeks placed more importance on what we may call subcategories of waste, which were based on specific activities such as sweeping, any th anything thrown away during cleansing, and byproducts from wood processing. The anti-littering laws that focus nearly exclusively on crop loss also indicate that this was an important subcategory of waste. Waste was not something to gaze and marvel at unless it was not about waste in the strictest sense of the term. I've shown you the Azaraton, which was about conspicuous consumption and not about actual fruit debris. And I would like to add now a lost bronze um, statue group that originally stood on the classical Acropolis of Athens and was made by the famous sculptor Myron. The statue group is not about the disposal of the double through the outlaws that Athena had invented and came to dislike. And it's also not about Marcius reclaiming it from the waste stream for um, personal reuse. It is more about transgressions that led to painful death and so the satyr Marcius and Athena are not playing the same divine leap. If I were to map ancient Greek disposal practices and processes onto a continuum whose extreme poles are called appearance and disappearance, I would reconceptualize all dedications and pots as inoffensive waste. They were collected in rubbish heaps, but it was socially acceptable to reclaim objects from them and put them to new use. Depending on the degree of modification, they would reappear in a different shape or would serve a different function. Most rubbish heaps eventually disappeared in the course of construction work, and archaeologists find rubbish in layers leveling the ground as well as fills for street and underground structures. Occasionally, as in the case of the construction of the classical Acropolis, on top of massive amounts of destruction debris, a few spolia acknowledge and commemorate acts of deposition. Somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, I would place coppers, as it was collected and contained in copronos and in cesspools, but tolerated outside the house, littering the streets. At the other extreme end of the spectrum, there is offensive and dangerous waste that requires permanent removal or burial. This was not a routine activity, but required some discussion so as to, to find the most appropriate course of action to restore law and order. As the sky was out of their reach, perfect away places were barren landscapes that were only inhabited by nymphs, as well as large and deep waterscapes that could accommodate Poseidon and his extended family. Thank you for your attention.